When we go into space, robots are going to keep us company on that voyage. Right now, it'd be a pretty boring journey if they don't learn some social graces. Luckily for us, Heather Knight of NASA's JPL is working on how to make robots more social. Enjoy! Ignite is an ongoing series of speedy presentations. They've ranged from building multi-person pogo sticks to hacking chocolate, any topic that geeks hold dear. Each speaker gets only five minutes and 20 slides at auto advance every 15 seconds. The talk you're about to hear was recorded live at one of the featured Ignite events around the world. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Heather Knight and tonight I'm going to talk to you about an installation we did at Ishkai last week, an AI conference in Pasadena, and how we turned the AI gurus there into flying comets. Um, and this is an example of the larger rise of charismatic machines in society. Um, it was sponsored by JPL. It was really awesome to get paid to do an interactive installation. Our job was to engage the viewers and to inspire their personal identification with the cosmos and, of course, to promote JPL and its role at AI. Now, why do I like charismatic machines? I have a strong robots bias in my background. I worked both as an undergraduate and graduate student at the MIT Personal Robots Group. That's our robot MDS robot. And also in Paris at Aldebaran, who's the new... Uh, um, platform for the RoboCup competitions. Now, we all know technology is everywhere. Now, why can't it be as social as these social media tools and networks? Well, maybe it can. What does it take to have an expressive robot? It, can it be have human expressions? This is Kismet, created by Cynthia Brazil, the professor under whom I've worked the last six years before coming out here. And of course, this humanoid now. And so what does it mean? Where can we use these? Why is this important? Um, here's some examples. Here's Autumn on the left. He's used as a fitness and dieting coach and keeps you encouraged. Now your goals. Bandit, used by the USC, uh, some ro USC robots group to do uh, autism research and help people in their elderly care stay there for longer. Um, so obviously, I've got a big background in robots. I did my thesis on a robotic teddy bear and how it could understand social gestures. But suddenly, I've been thrown into the world of space at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So what do they do in space? What do they do in AI? They develop autonomous systems for rovers and for uh, vehicles that are traveling through space. They help make decisions about sending back information to Earth about what are interesting scientific features. But what about the future? If we have long missions, maybe the spaceships themselves need to work on the social interfaces between the astronauts and the rover. If they, oh, we are depending on them, if I were a future astronaut, to guide me, then I need to be able to trust them and treat it as more of a peer. They know more about landing, um, and they don't get hurt as easily, which is why Robonaut was developed to go on the outside of the space system, and we need to figure out how to be able to send it to commands and collaborate. Who cares about space? Here's some science fiction guys. The Earth is just too small and fragile a basket to keep all our eggs in. Life forever too dying to be born afresh. Dot, dot, dot. Must stretch its realm and miss the stars. Um, so our history is in the stars. We all came from the stars. As we like to say at JPL, we are all stardust. We are all once part of a burning sun. So that was the inspiration for our project at Ijkai last week. So we created an exhibition called Stardust. And there, we were at the, at the opening reception, and we were trying to get people to think about JPL and AI in space. So we turned them into stars through their cell phone. We created a motion tracking system that tracked the brightness um, of the light and turned the users into asteroids themselves. Some simple techniques were applied. We subtracted the background. When we tracked the objects, we modified the expected size to the cell phone and maintained a unique ID, which you could steal if you got close enough. So that helped with some of the interaction stuff. Um, and we also looked at using planar homography to uh, uh, take out the distortion of the installation angle of the camera. Although, at, you know, at night they were pretty small. It wasn't a big deal. Now, how do we create the graphics? We used a great language processing, a wrapper on Java, especially their particle systems. You give it an origin and some rules about how it expands, and you can create great things like 
comet tails that have uh, velocity and size, the decreasing sizes and alpha that make them disappear, and explosions. If people weren't moving enough, we wanted to keep them interacting, they would explode, which always um, is fun. Uh, there were also a, like a 3D star field that we're going in and out of. And so why do we care about this, and how does this tie back to robots? We are using this art to explore the potentials for interactive technology and how to best engage people. This is an exhibit, Cyber Flora, um, from a couple years ago. And here is the cloud um, in Italy, another interactive sculpture. And these are all representative of our future of machines that themselves will be able to better and engage and communicate with people. Pretty awesome stuff. I know, I know. Anyway, well, welcome to the future. I uh, just wanted to um, be your uh, first welcoming party. I also want to acknowledge our other contributors. We have Adam in the audience here today, and then there was also Dan Goods, David Thompson, and Kiri Wegstuff. Check me out at MarilynMonroeBot.com.